Welcome to This Week in Local, a Locology podcast featuring lively conversations about the local digital ecosystem, hosted by Locology analysts Mike Bolin and Charles Lachlan. Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Local. I'm Charles Lachlan, Senior Analyst at Locology, and today I'm joined by Ankit Patel, Senior Vice President of Engineering at Foursquare. Ankit, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Good to talk with you, Charles. Uh, Excited to be here. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate having you here. So talk to us just for a minute about your background, where you come from before Foursquare and how long you've been at Foursquare and, and what is your role? Got it. So prior to Foursquare, um, I spent 15 years in a wide array of roles and organizations inside of AWS and Amazon. Uh, I grew up as an engineer. Um, I led different programs, including Amazon Prime, uh, Alexa. And then my last role was building out the business for the internet of things. My passion has always been the intersection of technology meets data. And that's what led me to Foursquare. I've been here for two years. I joined back in uh, 2021 and still having a lot of fun. Um, I think the best way to describe my role is I make stuff happen and my team is amazing. And I I work with them to, to be able to deliver new and exciting things for our customers. That sounds like a very transferable role to any company. You make things happen. Okay. <laughs> That's the, I mean, I, I think more than anything, my favorite uh, slogan of all time is Nike's just do it. So okay. uh, that, that, that's, that's the a, way I look at it. Just get up and, and get it done. That I like that. Okay. So this may sound silly, but I think for the sake of our listeners, it's kind of important to establish what is Foursquare? Because I think people think of, oh, it's that check-in app from, you know, early in the last decade where you went to a restaurant and found out which of your friends were at the restaurant. It's evolved a lot since then. We don't have to go through all of that. But how would you describe what Foursquare is today? Foursquare is a technology company. Uh, We specialize in location-based services, apps, and analytics. Um, Yeah, uh, I think everyone remembers Foursquare from probably back in 2009, where the check-in app, but We've evolved. Uh, we're the largest leading independent geospatial uh, platform available. And so we we use a combination uh, of data, machine learning um, to, to power enterprises, uh, to kind of bridge the divide between the digital world and the physical one. Can you talk about who some of Foursquare's biggest users are? Yeah, so at, at the, the core of what we do, um, we try to deeply understand the world around us and how people move through that world. And so we're we're trusted by some of the biggest names in tech, um, Uber, Nextdoor, Snap, uh, just to name a few. Many of these customers of ours uh, leverage one or more of our geospatial products. Um, A lot of them leverage kind of our, our core product around places. And so you can think of this as uh, we keep track accurately of around 130 million uh, POI, points of interest around the world. And we have a, an accompanying product around movement where uh, we, we, we have insights uh, and data around how people move through those places. And then we build a wide variety of products geared to advertising, geared to marketing um, that uh, enable companies to leverage these technologies uh, to get better ROI on their advertising spend. Okay. Um... So what you just said tells me, kind of leads me to want to know what you're doing in retail, because that sounds like something in retail would be particularly useful in a retail environment. Is that fair? Yeah. I mean, if you think about it in the retail space, um, there, there's two use cases that definitely come up uh, all the time. The first one is, um, you know, I, I'm let's say I'm Starbucks. Uh, where should I open up my next location? So you can think about this as, as a pretty hard problem for Starbucks. Um, one, Starbucks are in all the major cities. They're probably around every every. They're on every major street, I think. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm in Seattle, so we love our coffee. So right, we're, we're I've been to the original coffee. one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but so yeah. you're 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 trying to, um, you know, if you're Starbucks, you're trying to figure out what makes your current locations very successful, and there's right. probably some that do better than others, and you're you're trying to get to a place where you're optimizing your return on investment, right? Trying to increase your market share, increase revenue. So how do you do that? And one of the core things that that we solve is being able to provide not only the data, but being able to do the analysis for for a company like Starbucks. So um, there's a lot of data that you need. Um, you know, you can think about this as you want neighborhood level data. Where are people going? Uh, what you know, what is available already there in that neighborhood? 
how are people moving, right? Like, where are they going and what number? Um, you know, are they visiting, you know, like Pete's Coffee? Are they visiting, um, you know, uh, the Starbucks that are already located? Um, you need to pull in, you know, points of interest data, so our places data, demographical data. Uh, maybe you want to go to sales data. You take all of this and what you're really trying to figure out is like, okay, how do my current stores do? And can I find equivalents in, inside of the, the the rest of these different neighborhoods? And so we provide solutions uh, around that. And so you can think of this as creating a scoring model. You build an ML model that says, um, am I able to access the thing that I want to access well enough? And then you can actually score different locations against it. And mm -hmm. so- what we really try to do is do the heavy lifting so customers can actually make well-informed decisions. Um, okay, okay. So one thing I'm curious about is the evolution of how you collect the data and how does that um, fuel the, what you do now? Yeah, so, I mean, look, at the core, right, we started as a consumer app company, right, mm -hmm. a social media platform. And the core to that was building out amazing experiences for our customers to like uh, see the world around them, right? Mm -hmm. Check out the cities that are there. And so you got to the check-in, which you talk about is like people checking in and saying, hey, I went there. Um, for for us, like the, in, in the, in the best way I can describe it is we take a privacy first approach to everything we do. And a large part of that is because of our DNA. But if you think about it, how it evolved is the problems we're trying to solve for our customers, right? Um, if you start with, okay, well, I'm checking in, well, wh where do I want to go next? Um, how do I understand, you know, wh where are others going to? And so all of these places create natural touch points for us to build uh, a very usable experience for them. And in turn, we're, we're, we're able to understand consumer behavior. And so for, for us, um, you know, we, we look at things from the standpoint, probably different than many others, that we don't look at like the data collection as like the 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 the, the, the primary reason why we build the experiences we do. We we believe, and other, otherwise customers wouldn't choose us, is we really focus on the, the consumer experience, right? And so we power a bunch of apps that are built on top of our technology. And then we also have our own apps like Swarm and City Guide that that are still heavily used. So the inputs are coming from not just your apps, but some partner apps, correct? Or yeah. Just, so just help me understand how is it? You know, how is this all assembled? Well, uh, a, a lot of machines take uh, <laughs> assembling all these data inputs, but you know, yeah. it, here, here's the best way you can uh, to, to, to to explain it. Mm -hmm. um, we have data sources, right? So we have our own and apps. Other apps leverage our 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 products and services. And we go. Could you give through... a couple examples of those. I'm sorry, but yeah. Yeah. So I mean, we, we provide a set of APIs, like uh, places right. APIs, right. And, and these can be like if you're building an app today and you want to know does your customer go into a certain like area, uh, like you're going to an arena. We can help you build geofences. We can help prompt and understand that location. We can help you uh, understand signal from um, where the customer is correctly is. Because one of the big things that many, you know, if, if you're serious about lo like creating a, a usable experience, like GPS data is like wildly off and it's actually worse in like city, uh, in cities than in rural areas. And so mm -hmm. we help customers. Because there's so problems. much going on in such small spaces to, to understand yeah, what's then, going on within that space is beyond the scope of what GPS can do. Is that? Yeah. And it's also it? inaccurate, right? Like GPS mm -hmm. data can like, like the, the signal from your phone can like, uh, move like 25 right. meters right, right. within seconds. And so it, you, you create a really frustrating experience if you, you're moving uh, all over the place, right? You really don't know. And so to, to us, we build developer APIs that people leverage. We have our own and operated apps. Um, I, I think it's important. I just want to like make clear everything that we do with data as notice and consent, right? And so I just want to make that super important. No, no, because no, that's fine. It's I so mean, important I, for I, us I, to do. You, you said it's in your DNA. I assume that's because it's sort of the uh, permission-based nature of checking in, right? Uh, kind of that's yep. how it started, and that was a you know the consumer was sort of inherently agreeing to the, the whole thing because they're checking in using the app. That so you sort of started from that sort of permission-based heritage, I guess, for lack of a better way to describe. Yep, that's the the DNA that we started with. Okay, fair enough. Okay, let's let's move on. So, um, 
you mentioned geospatial. You've sort of been talking about geospatial. I want to back up a little and define that a little bit better. Yeah, but, no, great thing. Great, great. Yeah. Uh, so what is geospatial data, right? Um, another term for it, pro- heavily used is spatial data, but it, it really is about representing features, objects on the Earth's surface. And so you okay. can think about this like more discreetly as like, where are those locations of those places? What is the shape of those? And then you can think of like every attribute possible, like how big is it? How tall is it? Like, what, what can I walk on it? Can I not? And so it really is explaining everything that exists on top of the earth. Right. How do you put it into action for for brand? I mean, look, look, let's take Starbucks. We can talk mm-hmm. about any, any brand possible. So, um, you know, one of the big things that, geospatial data uh, enables is it helps you make better informed decision making, right? You now have this context, you have this data, and so you can use this data to analyze patterns, trends, or relationships. Mm -hmm. And so a a few concrete examples of this is we first talked about how do I expand my site, right? How do I know what location to go to um, that I should expand my footprint? Or maybe which one should I like de-invest from? Right or are the the uh, you know, it's, it's as much which store to close as it is where to open the next it's open one, right? yeah, yeah and if you actually think about it like companies mm-hmm. like you know like there's McDonald's and Starbucks that have really figured out how to use geospatial data to do this because when you went through COVID not you didn't probably see many McDonald's or Starbucks close down um, but because they didn't have enough data to make a decision at that point <laughs> no I actually yeah. think you, did you see the lineup in front of McDonald's? I don't know. Like it, it, yeah. it, they, 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 they built things right. You didn't see that for many other places. Right. Um, another total area of this is like, okay, so I'm Starbucks. I'm, I'm going to market a healthy Frappuccino, right? And so I, I predominantly like advertise all over the internet, but you don't expect people to like buy their Frappuccino on my website. And so yeah. what you can do actually is use geospatial data to understand, am I driving people to visit my store? More interestingly, am I seeing people from the gym actually visit more often to these stores? Because I released now something that uh, caters to them. And so this is around measuring and analyzing your media. Okay. So you know it's working not just because people buy it, but because the people you're targeting are buying it because they're coming from the gym to Starbucks to buy this specific item that is marketed to them. Yeah. That- and then you can look at demographic data. Do they have it? Like So all of this allows you to... Um, better understand the conclusions you made or help you inform make conclusions. Okay. So there's not a retail decision that can't be informed by this kind of data. Is that fair? I, I mean, I mean, if, if you think about- What are the limitations, it, I guess, is what I'm asking. Yeah. I mean, look, mm-hmm. the, the big thing about geospatial data is hard to work with. If you work back uh, maybe like 15 years ago, one of the things that yeah, many people would say is like, okay, what, what can I do with financial data? Like, why is that so important? And then companies like Tableau came- and made it so easy to inform uh, better choices with that mm-hmm. data. It's the same thing with geospatial data. Because it's like literally a couple magnitudes bigger than any financial set of data, it's really hard to analyze. And so you can solve things. There's hundreds of use cases. And it's been interesting because we get to, I get to work with them. I get to be on the call with them. And, and then they're they're bringing up like, hey, could I use it for this? And the, the interesting part of it is like, hey, yeah, you probably can. And but geospatial data... Um, and we'll get into like what we're doing in a, in a second, but you want to be able to visualize a bunch of these data sets on a map and then have some analysis of those pattern and trends to inform better decision making. All of that, like before the cloud was prohibitively expensive, before IoT wasn't something that companies were willing to use as their decision making, but all of this is changing over the last five years. And so if if you look around, um, you know, businesses, I think like Gartner did this around 91% of like executives are saying over the next like three to five years, this is going to be their biggest area of how they're going to inform their business decision making for their for their companies. Is that a specific type of business leader from a specific set of businesses or any business? I mean, I think it, it, if you look at how Gartner surveys, I think it's people that are using enterprise SaaS solutions. Okay. That limits it somewhat, but not that much really. I mean, what business isn't using enterprise SaaS? No, uh, no, we, we yeah. do know that because any one of these well, SaaS big business anyway, yeah, yeah. And then, and then, and then mm-hmm. yeah. Okay, all. okay. So um, let's talk about, you said geospatial is hard to work with. Tell me a little more about that and then why, I think you've explained that, but it's maybe if it needs further explanation. And then what are you doing 
to make that more accessible, more easy to digest, more easy to make decisions from, et cetera? Does this, how does this uh, intersect with your new knowledge, your new graph that you recently released? Love it. You, you already know what we're doing. It's awesome, man. Uh, um, we just had a launch for it. So it, right. it's, it's really exciting time to talk about it. Um, look, geospatial data is difficult to to work with. It's really, because really it's big. big because it's multidimensional, et cetera. Yeah. Tell me. Yeah. So, so a little, there's a couple like there's, mul there's multiple dimensions to it. One mm -hmm. is it's extremely large, right? Yeah. Um, Just file size. Like, I mean, you're, yeah. you're thinking petabytes. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I figured that much. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a lot of bytes. <laughs> I think one of the big things is right now, um, there's the dated GIS systems you can think mm -hmm. about, like they, they exist and they require very specialized hardware and software. Um, if you use it, it's going to remind you of a Windows XP um, <laughs> experience. It's, mm -hmm. it's really um, geared towards experts and you have to hire GIS experts. And it, it's an area that's growing in terms of the people that are in it, but they are extremely hard to obtain and hire. Uh, because it's a very specialized skill. Mm -hmm. um, one of the big things is with geospatial analysis, this is what just comes down to is if you're a company trying to do this, you need really high quality data sets and you need more data sets than you have. So how do you do analysis when you require information on like, I want external sales data or demographical data or visitation? You may not have this information, likely you won't. So what that means is for all these companies that want to do this is, they go have to go acquire these data sets, uh, manage them, modify them, keep them up to date, and it's it's a huge undertaking. Um, comparatively, if you're doing financial data analysis, you have that financial data. You're the ones that are creating it. You don't need to augment this with other things. Mm -hmm. And so, when we looked at this problem, um, you know, we were starting to look at this problem a year and a half ago. Um, you know, we focused first. Uh, around visualization. The biggest thing about geospatial data makes it infinitely easier to do is not look at it in a traditional like data science notebook, like a Jupyter notebook, but you put it on a map. Right. And, and then the visual you, part is what's exciting about it, right? Is the the fact that it can be visually displayed better than a lot of types of data. Is that right? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, yes and one, no. Okay. Be, yeah. Give so, me the yes part. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 one, it, it naturally lends itself because it has That's like a lot of yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. to be on yeah. a map. Yeah. Um, what makes it useful, specifically with geospatial data, to put on a map is there's like, you, you got like billions of data points. You won't be able to understand this in like a notebook, like typical, right. like if you have a few metrics, you can work through it, you can build a model. You tr really need to put it on a map and then figure out, right, okay, where's the in this what are the patterns that i'm seeing because many of these things you're you're you have hypotheses you need to create you can't do that if you don't put it on a map so we focused a lot on visualization so we have a product called foursquare studio that was founded by the people that built the open source technologies that are used right now for geospatial technology and they built an amazing product for us and it's foursquare studio what we realized is well you still need to be experts right you need to be a, like a, a geospatial expert to leverage and make use of the like our, our Foursquare Studio, and so how do we lower that barrier to like the the product managers, the business analysts, the person that's running operations, and that's where the graph came into be. So, so the whole point of the graph is to just make kind of cut out some of the barriers to actually understanding the data and how it applies to your business. Is that yeah, exactly right, Charles. Okay. Um, the okay. graph. That, that we built is a geospatial knowledge graph. Um, I, I think it's super important because the, the term knowledge graph is um, a, a really hot term right now in-, in, in Yeah, fashion. you see it a lot. You do see it a lot, yeah. yeah. So, so what we do is, you know, you can have a lot of data. Now the question is, how do you know what that data means? And a, a knowledge graph provides meaning to that data. And so what we did is, I think a very novel and it's like industry leading way of organizing geospatial data in a way that everything like, so w we focused on a few parts of this at the core layer, every companies need high quality data. So let's produce very fine grain specific data sets for, for every imaginable use case that we can think of that customers need. 
So you can think of this as demographical data, user data, movement data, uh, POIs. And how do we break those down into like building blocks so that people can piece these things together? The next set is you want to put everything in a way that you can view it on a map or do analysis against. So what we do is we tile everything on an H3 grid system. So if you think about like popular- H3 uh, is from Uber, right? Correct. And so uh, similarly, the engineers that worked on H3 are the ones that are uh, have built the systems that they exist for us. And just to, to, sorry to pause, but H3 is kind of a, it's, it's a, it's a grid system. Is it fair? I mean, tell me what it, it's a way of understanding spaces, right? I mean. Yeah. So, so H3 for, for, for what, what most people know about is it's, it's a grid system. So it's a tiling system. So basically yeah. when you look at, um, you know, if you've ever been on a map and then you've clicked in or clicked out, you can see it retiling. It's right. a smaller and smaller. Does it section. have any, uh, is that long a good comparison or is it, it's just such a completely different thing? I mean, if, if you think about it in the traditional sense, like people mm -hmm. uh, had squares before. That was yeah. a grid system. And, yeah. and the problem with the, uh, like we can get into like the differences, but an H3 is an upgraded version. That One of the things about a hexagon. That, that's good is, enough for the podcast. <laughs> yeah, great. Okay. Uh, we could talk mm -hmm. maybe over a yeah. beer one day. Yeah. But, um, because we grid everything, you can now overlay this data and you can write now a simple query against the graph um, that can do all of this heavy processing without um, specialized hardware, specialized software. And instead of doing these in hours or days to run these queries, you can do these in minutes. Okay. So it's like game changing. The ability- okay, The speed is game changing. Okay, I just wanna, sorry to interrupt, but what yep. I wanna get to is how does taking this very complex, heavy, hard to work with geospatial data using this graph that you've just released. Tell me what can an enterprise do now that they couldn't do before? So let's take, for example, let's go back to the exact example of the, like, how do I open a new location? Okay. Right. You need all this wide variety of data sets that you don't have, or you need to acquire them. We provide them to you. We have them as part of our core knowledge graph. Mm -hmm. And so what you can do now um, is we can query against our graph, our knowledge graph, so that you can actually say, okay, tell me areas that I should open up a store given these criteria are really important to me. And okay. we do the heavy lifting of processing the data, overlaying it. Now you can visualize it on a map. You can access it in a data set. So we, we effectively, like, Though I, I came from AWS. We focus on removing heavy lifting and we keep working right. up that chain here at Foursquare. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I get the I get the sense that the purpose of the graph was to make this kind of data that was formerly inaccessible accessible. Okay. That's correct, right? So, okay. That, that so those decisions we talked about, you know, where to open the next Starbucks becomes easier and more powerful working with this data. But does the data does this something that they can take themselves and work with themselves, or do they sort of have to have you? you know, fly the plane for them in this. Yeah. Right now, what we've launched at this point is the graph to power our internal products. Mm -hmm. What we are going to get to over, you know, some short period of timeline, uh, start releasing this out in different variations of product. What we care most about is, um, and, and from a product standpoint is, what is the customer's problem and how can we most easily solve that for them? Right now, the world works on, you know, sending data and data sets. I think that world is changing. Like yeah. in the end, when we I talk to customers, what they don't want to do is have the, they don't want to invest in the data experts, the geo, geospatial experts to make sense of this. They want insights. And so that's one of the areas that we're going to go first into is being able to generate very useful insights for customers. Okay. All right. I want to end with a lightning round of a couple of quick questions, if that's all right. Yeah. First question are. is, how is AI changing your business? That may not I mean, be a quick one, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it already has. Um, okay. You know, um, machine learning, AI are, are been core to, whenever you get to, you have petabytes of data, gone are the days you can have rules-based systems. So we've been on that edge of leveraging machine learning and AI uh, for, for, for all the things that we do yeah. now, what does it mean with the advent of now? I think where it is like generative AI right. and being able to, to, to help, um, humans do things easier, faster, better generate those. Those are all areas that we are in active experimentation and, and knowledge. In, fa in fact, um, just, a, a 
uh, two weeks ago, we had a company-wide hack day where um, many of the ideas that floated around are are some things that we're going to be thinking about putting into products or um, adding into our consumer apps. So more to come on all that, but nothing right now to share. On, okay, on how okay. you stuff. mentioned IoT is an interest area for you. Um, yep. Personally, professionally, I'm sure both. Uh, give me a minute on what's next with IoT, where, where it goes in the near term. Yeah, I mean... IoT, if you look back uh, seven years ago, it was all focused on like smart devices, right? Like things moving yeah. around. You put My refrigerator telling me I'm out of eggs. Yeah. yeah. I mean, some of that was useful. Some of it was gimmicky. And then yeah, uh, yeah. hopefully most of that died. Mm -hmm. um, the The premise of IoT, look, where the, this has been for the last five years is moving closer and closer to um, companies making uh, and, and optimizing uh, efficiency increasing revenue and optimizing automation. That's the future. Like uh, logistics and supply chain, if you think about over the last, like through COVID, a big change in how uh, trucks are routed, how supply chain is done, how do you ensure your product's there at the right place um, was all done by IoT devices and sensors. So trucks now standard practice are all uh, fitted with IoT devices. You understand where they're at, what the cargo of it is. How do you ensure things are being delivered? If you think about in food, you have a shelf life of things. And so it has been driving a ton of value already there. And that's going to continue. So it's more uh, in our lives than we realize already is kind of. What oh, yeah, yeah. correct. It, it's there to save and make businesses do better decisions. The interesting part, and this is all going to come out over the next five to 10 years, is the way we do the drive towards automation. And so, for example, even in like car manufacturing or any of these areas, it's still like the, the way those cars are built are having heavily automated machinery that are, that have humans doing many of the jobs in between. Could you get to a place where more and more of that's automated? And that's where it comes to uh, leveraging IoT systems. Um, IoT systems are going to be able to do things um, with like um, dealing with like human safety, being able to do things in real time, doing things with um, precision and control that haven't been available right now. And so you see early companies that are leveraging this. Tesla is one of them. This is going to continue and continue as you see in the auto manufacturing area specifically. Okay, great. I think we could talk about a lot more, but I'm, I think we're about out of time. I'm going to have to wrap it up here. Ankit, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks everyone for listening. This has been This Week in Local. Stay tuned every week for more episodes. I'm your host, Charles Lachlan. Our regular co-host, Mike Boland, is off this week. Thanks to today's guest, Ankit Patel from Foursquare. You can find the show on all major podcast networks, and you can find out more at Locology.com. Please subscribe, like, and comment. Our producer is Dara Sweat. Thanks for listening, and see you next week. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Locology's This Week in Local with Mike Boland and Charles Lachlan. Be sure to subscribe for more.